So today we're going to start looking at plant classification. So kind of getting an idea as to the categories that plants fall into and why they are put in those categories. First, I do want to review the alternation of generation life cycle as it's really important that you understand this. So yes, you will see this again. Okay, so let's start with our baby plant. Like once the seed starts germinating, you know, remember within our seed we had a zygote and it is a diploid multicellular sporophyte generation. That's what that embryo within the seed looks like. Undergoes mitosis until and maturation until you have a full-grown sporophyte. So all the plants that you're used to seeing, your oak trees, your ferns, anything like that that you are used to seeing is the sporophyte generation. So within the sporangium, um, cells undergo meiosis to produce spores and those spores are um, a part of the gametophyte generation and through mitosis they mature into the mature gametophyte generation or the gametophyte stage. Again this is a multicellular but it's a haploid stage. And then portions of the gametophyte called the, gam the gametangia, antheridia in male and archegonia in female produce the gametes. So we produce egg from the archegonia and sperm from the antheridia. And then fertilization takes place and then we are back into the diploid sporophyte generation. So that's just a review for you for the alternation of generation life cycle. Okay, so Basically what we're doing is we are breaking it down into um, what we mentioned before as our bryophytes, which are our non-vascular plants. And then, then we're gonna go into our vascular plants. And remember we discussed that vascular meant that they have specialized tissue called xylem and phloem that are used to transport nutrients and water and minerals throughout the plant. So with our so we have non-vascular and we have vascular. And then the vascular is broken down into seedless and then the plants that produce seeds. So that's where we're going today. So for today you're going to need your plant classification chart. So you can break it all down and organize it. Um, makes it a little easier for memorization. So as I said, we have our vascular and our non-vascular plants. So our va non-vascular are our bryophytes. And then those that are vascular that um, do not produce seeds produce spores. And that's our ferns, our lycophytes, and what we call our fern allies. Again, those are like whisk ferns and some other things that will look familiar. And then we have vascular plants that do produce seeds. And they fall into two categories our gymnosperms and our angiosperms. Okay, so first let's talk about vascular versus non-vascular plants in a little more detail um, than we mentioned before. So the only plants that are non-vascular plants are the bryophytes. And so all the other plants are included in what's called the vascular plants. So Let's talk about vascular tissue. Um, we mentioned it before, xylem and phloem, they are conductive tissue. Xylem um, transports water, ion, minerals, up from the soil into those tissues that require them. And then phloem transports nutrients all throughout the plant. So looking at our tissues within a plant. Here we have our vascular tissue that we just talked about. We have what's called ground tissue and we have what's called dermal tissue. So in this example the vascular tissue is in the center which it generally is and we're looking at a stem here 
and then the bulk of the plant is usually made up of ground tissue. And then just like you would expect, the dermal tissue is that outer layer of tissue. You've seen vascular bundles if you look at celery. It's these strings in celery that may get in your teeth when you're trying to eat it. You may have had experience with um, colored water being transported up through the celery and changing the color of the leaves. You might have done experiments with that when you were in elementary school. Um, that is because m the majority of that is xylem tissue and it's transporting that water that's colored up to the leaves. So we went through this earlier, but um, I can't say it enough. <laughs> Looking at the transport of water and sugars in plants. Um, so the physical forces that we talked about before, um, such as cohesion, adhesion, uh, help to drive the transport of water across long ranges. So transport really occurs on three scales. So first we have within a cell, right? At the cellular level, for instance, um, right across a root membrane. Um, the water comes right in. Uh, it can go into the vacuole. Remember we talked about the opening and closing, particularly of stomata. No, that's not in the roots. Sorry, I know <laughs> I jumped there. But, um, but within a cell, we have that water going in and out of the large vacuole uh, to allow for the opening and closing of the stomata. So that's an example of a uh, transport across in a cellular level. We have short distance cell to cell and that really is more in the roots. If the water comes across the first cell, then it has to be transported to the next in order to bring it within the plant. And then the long distance transport occurs through xylem and phloem. So that's throughout the whole plant. So the water would come in across the roots and like we said, up through the xylem, through cohesion and adhesion, through transpiration and out into the atmosphere. Okay, let's talk about the classification. That's why we're here today, right? I just wanted to review some of that from our last lecture because it is really important. Okay, bryophytes. These are the non-vascular plants, right? The only non-vascular. And they are the only land plants that are gametophyte dominant. So gametophyte meaning that they live most of their time in a haploid stage and they live in very moist environments, which you would expect because they don't have the vascular tissue to transport water long distances. Um, they can re reproduce sexually or asexually, and they have what's called rhizoids. So why don't they have roots? Well, the definition of a root is that it requires vascular tissue. So by definition, bryophytes can't have roots. So rhizoids are what anchor them to the ground. Um, so they sort of have the same function as a root, but by definition they can't be called a root because they don't have vascular tissue. So they're generally uh, low-lying plants. They can actually lie dormant for very long periods of time. Um, I put this little example in here just because it was really fascinating. Um, there have been bryophytes found in glaciers that are thought to be 400 years old. They kind of lay dormant for long periods of time. And there are three types of bryophytes. There are liverworts, hornworts, and mosses. And those three, I kind of laid them all out on your chart. Um, so let's take a quick look at each one of those. Okay, first are the liverworts, and they kind of come in two varieties. There's the thallus and the leafy. So there's a structure called a thallus, and that's the plant body um, that's not differentiated into stems and leaves and lacks true roots but it, and a vascular system, but it's the major body of the liverwort. So the thallus kind means that that, that that thallus is flattened and it's very thin. Um, so for instance, actually did I put one of those on here? Hmm. I might not have actually. Um, and then 
the second kind is the leafy kind, and that's where the majority of liverworts live. And so if you look at them like here, this portion looks very much like a leaf. So that's the leafy um, liverwort. So if you'll remember, um, they can produce sexually or asexually. So they have what's called a gemma cup or gemma cup. And we'll take a look at these in lab. They're right here. That's one type of reproduction, and that is their asexual reproduction. And then, of course, they have male and female gametophytes. So here's one. That's a male, and this is a female. So, so the second and third picture is um, an example of how they then have sexual reproduction as well. So this is what that looks like, um, their, their life cycle. So first of all, let's start with this right here is their, um, their thallus that we talked about, and here are the rhizoids that anchors them to the ground. Here is the gemmy cups for asexual reproduction. Um, but they can additionally have produce a female gametophyte and a male gametophyte. So here are our words again. In the male gametophyte, or the, it could also be called the gametangia, um, there is an antheridia head that houses all the antheridia. Here's another antheridia, another antheridia, and within them, spores are produced. I'm sorry. Sperm, sorry about that. Sperm are produced. And then in our archegonial head, there's a whole bunch of little archegonia, and that's where the eggs are produced. So then they can come together, and remember they live in very moist environment, uh, and there is sexual reproduction. Next is our hornworts. And I should back up and just say the word wart, W-O-R-T, was an Anglo-Saxon word that meant herb. So that's where that comes from. Um, so hornworts, uh, hopefully we're going to have a sample of this that you can see in labs as in the lab as well. And they have, um, <coughs> excuse me, they have a thallus right here that looks kind of ribbon-like. And then the sporophyte generation that it produces is very horn-like. Okay, so um, that hence the name hernwort. And they can actually uh, reproduce asexually via fragmentation. So the, uh, if these uh, horns break off, then they can immediately start reproducing as well. Um, in addition to that, at the tip of these horns, that's where uh, spores are produced. So each sporophyte, so each one of these horns has one chl chloroplast per cell, which is pretty cool. Um, they're so thin, so it's not like multiple chloroplasts that you normally see in land plants, um, but just one per cell. So that's unique to this one. So this is just an example of the life cycle of the spore, uh, sorry, of the hornwort. Something to keep in mind for all of these bryophytes is that here's the gametophyte generation with the sporophyte growing out of it. That sporophyte generation is dependent on this gametophyte. If the gametophyte were not present, that sporophyte could not live. So it's still dependent. And the third bryophyte is the mosses. That's probably the one that you are the most familiar with, and it's actually the largest group of bryophytes. So they reproduce sexually, and there are three kind of different types of mosses. Uh, one is peat moss, which may sound familiar to you. Second is granite mosses, and third is what we call the true mosses. So let's talk about peat moss, or more accurately sphagnum peat moss. 
Um, it, they grow in bogs that are in cooler climates. In particular, they're abundant in Canada, in the bogs of Canada. And they can store large amounts of water, like 16 to 26 times their weight in water. And um, they just store that inside their cells. And then um, peat moss doesn't decay very rapidly. One, because it's in a cooler climate, but also because they tend to be, um, their well, their cell walls are embedded with uh, phenolic compounds. And so they continue to like pile on top of each other and decay very, very slowly. And they tend to live like in these bogs, it's more of an anaerobic condition. So anaerobic decay is much slower than aerobic decay. Um, so they work really well as a soil amendment um, and kind of like a mulch. And part of that has to do with their absorption of water. So that's the reason that you put mulch on your flower beds is because it holds in the water that can basically slowly release it into the soil when the soil dries out. So sphagnum peat moss, um, because its ability to retain so much water works really well for that. And also because when uh, that peat moss is developing, so peat means like um, partially decayed, just so you know. Um, so as it is partially decaying, it tends to absorb carbon dioxide from the air, but also cations from its surroundings like calcium and magnesium. So when you use it as a soil amendment, it, it puts that back into the soil. So sphagnum and peat moss is a huge component of gardening in general, but it falls into the bryophyte category. Yeah, so here you go. It is commercially available. <laughs> and then if you look on our map over here, uh, you can see sort of where it is largest, sorry, where the populations of it are the largest. That's up here. And you'll get to know a little bit more about that when we talk about biomes. But Canada, and then this whole northern section just under the Arctic Circle, basically. Okay, and here's our granite moss. Um, I'm probably not going to say a whole lot about this. Um, it's It grows on alpine rocks, so high elevation. And it, it's what tends to form that reddish-brown look to rocks. And then there's our true mosses. And we are definitely going to take a look at these in lab. Um, in fact, this very one probably. And again, through its life cycle, this is going to make a lot of sense to you because we've talked about it a thousand times. So here's our zygote. This is our baby plant. And then as it, uh, sorry, and we're in the sporophyte generation. And here we go, moving on. Here is the mature sporophyte. At the top it has a capsule. And within that capsule is the sporangium. Okay, so that's where the spores are produced. And then those spores start to germinate. And as they do, they undergo mitosis and they produce the gametophyte generation. And our gametophyte generation, um, it will produce two different type of gametophyte plants, one that is male and one that is female. So as you would guess, the male contains an antheridia at the top, several of them, and the female produce a bunch of archegonia. And then fertilization occurs and we are back to zygote in the diploid stage. So you're going to see this life cycle over and over again um, in the different plants. All right, non-vascular done, check. Um, we're going to move on to our vascular plants that are seedless. So ferns is probably the best example of that. So all of our seedless vascular plants are sporophyte dominant. Remember when we were talking about the bryophytes, 
they were dominated by their gametophyte generation. Now we're moving into more complex plants and these are the ones that are dominated by the sporophyte generation, that diploid generation. They have vascular tissue, so now we can use those terms, leaves, roots, and stems, and mean it. Um, and so, of course, like I've mentioned, this includes our ferns and our fern allies and the lycophytes. So what's the difference between a spore and a seed? One main difference is their size. So spores are very tiny. Some, some of them are even microscopic, so you don't see them. Seeds are much larger. larger. Sorry, bleh, can't talk. Um, our seeds can be haploid or diploid, but they are all, like if, if one plant produces them, they are all the same size. And that is completely different from a spore, which comes um, in two different types. There's either homosporous or heterosporous. And so <laughs> if we have homosporous, then they're the same size, but if they are heterosporous, then they're broken down into a small male spore, which is a microspore, or a large female spore, which is a megaspore. I think you'll understand that as we kind of look at it separately. Um, spores are unicellular, so very simple. And then seeds, of course, are multicellular because you know what that looks like. Um, they have an environment that's capable of nurturing the plant and they have mechanisms for nourishing and defending the embryo. So back to our spores, they require a moist environment for growth. They have to land in an area where it's moist. Seeds, however, can sprout just about anywhere because they have all everything they need within the seed itself. And so where are spores versus seeds located? Spores are located underneath the leaves of non-flowering plants. However, seeds are located either in a fruit or a flower because seeds are associated um, with flowering plants. Okay, let's look at the lycophytes. We'll begin there. So we see these in the fossil record and of course also in present day. These are our club mosses. And if you take a look at this on the right, You'll see why it's called a club moss. Um, at the very top, this part right here, almost looks like a bat or a club, and so it is called a club moss. So these are thought to have been the earliest of vascular plants. That's where that thought comes from. Um, and they have a type of true leaf that's called a microphyll. And it's called that because it contains only one strand of vascular tissue, just one. So it's when you think of leaves, you may think of all the veins that run through it. That's multiple vascular um, strands. So that is not present in these lycophytes. They have one strand of vascular tissue in their, in their leaf called a microfill. So their sporangia is housed in the stroboli, which is this club that we talked about. That's its name, a stroboli. And they have Rhizo rhizomes, not to be confused with rhizoids. So let me just say that very slowly <laughs> and emphatically. Rhizoids were present in the bryophytes. They do not contain vascular tissue. These lycophytes have rhizomes. What rhizomes are, are an underground stem that grow from the roots. So that underground stem has vascular tissue, but when it's placed underground, it's called a rhizome. And our lycophytes produce, produce homospores. So they're spores that grow into one type of gametophyte. So this is just to come back to that microfill versus megafill leaf type. So our lycophytes have these microfills, one single vein. Megafills have the single vein and then branching veins off from the side. But like I said, our lycophytes have microfills. Okay, so this is just the anatomy of a lycopodium. That is a specific club moss that we're gonna be looking at in lab. 
So let's start at the bottom. Okay, it has true roots, and those roots, of course, have vascular tissue, so that's pointing that out here. And then they have the rhizome, which is an underground stem. And then they also additionally have an aerial stem with these branching leaves. And remember, these leaves are microfills, right? Here they are. And then we have the stroboli. Stroboli is plural, so each one would be a strobilus. And that's where that name club moss comes from. And within that, there are the sporangia where the spores are produced. And again, if you take a look at the microfill or the leaf, there's one vascular tissue, one strand. So this is a cross section of the leaf. Okay, now we're going to talk about our pteridophytes, and that's basically our ferns and what we call our fern allies. Still vascular and seedless, so they produce spores. Um, they live in very damp environments, and you know that because if you've ever seen a forest with uh, ferns all on the floor, it's usually a very damp forest. Uh, they still have the rhizomes that we talked about, those underground stems. And this time they have what's called a megafill. So the megafill means that it has branching veins. So it's not constricted to just one single vascular strand. And this is usually associated with the ability to capture more solar energy. So better um, photosynthesizers essentially. So most of them in this category have homospores, but some have heterospores. So what heterospores means is that you're going to produce a male gametophyte and a female gametophyte, and those are going to be two separate plants, whereas the homospore just produces one type of gametophyte. Okay, so this category includes our ferns, our whisk ferns, and horsetails. So these are horsetails, in case you were wondering, and these are whisk ferns and then our standard fern over here. Um, our horsetails and our whisk ferns still have the megafills, but they're very reduced, so they're a lot smaller. So when we look at our ferns in particular, um, what we call, call those megafills are fronds, right? Our fern fronds, and that's over here to the right. So the sporangia on these is located on the back of the frond. You've probably seen them before. They're little bumps on the back of the fern frond. Well, each one of these little dots is called a sori, or sorry, sori is all of them together. A sorus is the individual. And um, they're protected by this structure right here called the indusium. And so this is where all the spores are going to be produced within the sorus, but it's pr protected by the indusium. It's a layer um, that just makes sure that they don't dry out. Okay, fern life cycle. This is something I'm going to ask you to know in detail. This is the second time that you're seeing it, <laughs> so let, let me walk you through it one more time. Okay, again, we're going to start with the zygote, okay? Um, keeping in mind that this is coming from, we have the gametophyte generation right here that was the heart, and then we had fertilization occur. So now the sporophyte generation is beginning to grow. At the beginning stages, this gametophyte generation is still there. As the sporophyte um, matures, you'll see the fiddleheads first. That's something you guys might be familiar with. And there's going to be an underground rhizome, but it still has roots. And then as it matures, you'll have the mature frond. And then on the back of that frond is going to be our sorus, protected by the indusium. And within the sorus, there's that sporangium where the spores are produced. 
Um, one thing we didn't really talk too much about is this annulus. Um, that is the sporangium that's in here. So the annulus works as it dries out to release the spores and those spores then can germinate in a very moist environment into a gametophyte which again is the haploid stage and as it matures here we have a mature gametophyte multicellular haploid gametophyte um, and for this um, it is going to have rhizoids because remember the gametophyte generation is not the vascular generation. The sporophyte generation is, therefore it has official roots. Okay, so then we have our gametangia, remember our archegonia and our antheridia that produce our sperm and egg that come together for fertilization and have a zygote. Okay, I know you've seen that and um, twice now. I'm hoping that that caught on. If there's anything um, that you don't understand, please email me. And if you need me to go over it in person, I'm happy to do that. If you'll just shoot me a quick email, I'll know to do that when we're in lab. Because um, I know it can get to be a little overwhelming, but it's so fascinating. But once you start to learn the pattern, you'll see it over and over again in each of the life cycles that we look at. So I just wanted to show you just an up close look at uh, the ejection of the spores from the an annulus because that's that sporangium that we talked about. Um, so it just has really neat cells on the outside of the annulus here that are filled with water but as they start to dry out, as they're supposed to, um, then um, an air bubble takes its place and once that pops basically it basically spews all these spores into the environment so it really works to spring load it out into the environment so it can go farther all right next is our vascular plants and these are the ones with that contain seeds so seeded vascular plants and that falls into two categories are our gymnosperms and our angiosperms. So a couple of things that are unique to vascular plants that produce seeds. Um, again, now that we have these are more complex plants, the sporophyte generation is going to be dominant. Um, vascular tissue is present, so we have true leaves, roots, and stems still. Um, all of these are going to have heterospores and um, megaphils as well. And like I've said before, it it, this includes our gymnosperms and angiosperms. So here's our seed. We talked about the difference between spores and seeds. So this is just to give you an idea of the anatomy, um, once again, of a seed. So it contains the sporophyte embryo. So that's right here. And, um, and it has stored food in the form of an endosperm and then it also has a protective seed coat. Um, so the embryo itself contains embryonic leaves, it has what's called cotyledons, and it has the primary root or the radical. And these cotyledons are going to become important as we um, go further into plants and how they're classified. So just going to go ahead and draw your attention to that. Those cotyledons are what we call the first true leaves uh, before the embryonic leaves come out. Okay, so we said that it that this particular grouping is heterosporous, right? So let's talk about the microspores and the megaspores. So microspores are what become the male gametophytes and oftentimes this is called the pollen grain. And if you take a look at the pollen grains up close, this is highly magnified, they're very spiky. Well that allows them to stick to things very well 
Um, so it helps in the pollination process, which we'll talk about. That's also what causes you to sneeze. <laughs> it's what gets trapped into your nasal cavities and irritates um, your nose and sinus or eyes or anything else. Okay, what we call pollination um, occurs when the pollen grain itself is brought into contact with what we call the ovule. Um, once it comes in contact with it, the pollen grain develops what we call a pollen tube. And that pollen tube is what um, allows for the sperm to swim towards the egg inside the ovule. So this is what ma makes it unique. Um, if you think about what we've talked about before with the egg and sperm needing to have a really moist environment requiring water for that sperm to swim, when we looked at the bryophytes that meant that they had to live in a very moist environment because it's open environment for swimming for that sperm. So this is a much more advanced way of, um, of fertilization because the pollen grain develops a pollen tube that is moist so it keeps that sperm moist the entire time and it's not in open air environment so it protects that sperm uh, for fertilization to occur. So the megaspore is the larger one, right? And that's what becomes the female gametophytes or what we call the ovules. And the ovule is what contains an egg. So once fertilization takes place, that ovule develops into a seed. Okay, so there are two groups of seeded plants. We have the gymnosperms and the angiosperms. So our gymnosperms are cone-bearing plants, or mostly cone-bearing plants. And so these are going to look familiar to you as like pine trees, uh, spruce trees, that kind of thing. And these are woody plants. Now, woody is, has a specific definition. So wood is secondary xylem. Um, and we're going to talk in detail about that later, but just for now you can think uh, a much harder structure. And lignin in the cell walls, that means wood. And so gymnosperms are woody plants. And their ovules are not completely covered by sporophyte tissue at the time of pollination. So that, that's our gymnosperms. Our angiosperms, on the other hand, are every flowering plant. So they can be woody or they can be what's called herbaceous, which means that those plants don't contain wood. So they kind of have a softer stem, for instance. And the angiosperms, their ovules are completely enclosed with sporophyte tissue, um, which is the ovary, and that becomes a fruit. All right, let's talk about these gymnosperms. So gymnosperm actually means naked seed, and that's because of that, um, because of the fact that the sporophyte tissue doesn't completely enclose it. And it's found in all kinds of environments. They're... Um, often associated with building materials. This is where you, like your pine comes from, that sort of thing. So it includes conifers, which is the most abundant, um, and then also cycads, ginkgos, and nettophytes. All right, let's talk about what monoecious and dioecious mean. Because these are terms that tend to throw people off, so I'm hoping that we will um, come to an understanding because we're going to use it on a regular basis. So monoecious means a single plant. That single plant, mono one, carries both the male and female reproductive structures on that same one plant. So for instance, our pine trees have a female strobili and a male strobili, or think female cone and male cone. Those two are on the same singular plant, so that is monoecious. Dioecious, on the other hand, means that there's a male plant and a female plant. And so, for instance, our ginkgo tree has male plants and female plants. Two separate plants for the separate sexes. 
Okay, so conifers. These are our cone bearing. So there are pollen cones and seed cones, just like we just looked at in the pine tree. So they are monoecious. They're usually pollinated by wind and they tend to have the tough needle-like leaves, um, like we talked about with the pine trees or the spruce or, um, I'm trying to think, um, redwoods. So these include the oldest living trees because the oldest living trees so far are redwoods. Um, and they are sporophyte dominant, as are all of our seeded vascular plants. So here we are with another life cycle again. <laughs> um, and I may allow you to take a look at this on your own. I'm just trying to think if it's helpful for me to walk you through it. I certainly don't mind. Um, all right, here, we'll, we'll just get through it. Um, so let's start again with our zygote. And that's um, gonna be within the seed this time because this is a seeded vascular plant. And there's food storage, and here's the embryo. And so when you're looking at, for instance, this is a pine tree. Um, this seed has a wing and that allows it to go through the air. Okay, so that develops into a mature sporophyte. So there's your big old tree. And we have, remember this is a monoecious tree. So on the same tree, we have, um, let's see, which one is that? We have male cones and we have female cones. So within our male cone, we have pollen sacs or microsporangium, which would of course produce the microspore, which remember what we said that was? pollen. And then we have our um, female cones that have a megasporangium that then produces the megaspore, which is the ovule with the egg. And then um, with our pollen grain, I'm going to have you look at it a little closer up here. Um, Okay, this is just an aside. This is what the pollen grain looks like in pine trees. They actually have little wings on them. And so maybe we'll get a chance in lab to take a look at that under the microscope. It's pretty cool. Okay, so back to our pollen grain. Our pollen grain, remember, produces a pollen tube through which the sperm can swim through. And when it does, then it can reach the archegonium where the egg is and fertilization occurs. And then we are back into the diploid stage again. Okay, the second type of gymnosperm is a cycad. And this is still cone bearing, um, has po uh, pollen cones and seed cones. So this one is dioecious because it has male plants and female plants. So in our pictures over here, um, uh, this is our male plant, and here is our female plant. Um, and it has, it's unique in that it has a multi-flagellated sperm. So typically you think of sperm as having one flagella. This one has multiples. Um, and so, kind of interesting, this one is pollinated by insects. Uh, they, it's in a uh, tropical to subtropical climate. It's actually used a lot for landscaping in Florida. Uh, this is called a sago palm and we will have one in lab as well so you can just take a look at it and see what that looks like. And then our third type of gymnosperm is ginkgo trees and I don't know if you've ever had the chance to see them before. They're actually very beautiful trees. Um, in Winston-Salem if you've ever been to Old Salem in Winston-Salem, they have a graveyard called God's Acre. And throughout that, there are these extremely large ginkgo trees. They were planted a long time ago, so it's really cool to see. Um, they're unique in that they have these leaves that are shaped almost like a fan, like a handheld fan, you know? Um, of course, they're much smaller than that, but they're just very pretty. But anyway, so they are also cone-bearing, and they are dioecious. So we have male plants and female plants. Now, the interesting thing is 
when these are used in landscaping, people only plant male, no, female, sorry, female um, plants because the male plants stink like crazy, so nobody wants them in their gardens. Um, so again, they have a multi-flagellated sperm, and they are sporophyte dominant, of course. And then our fourth are the netophytes. And these also are cone-bearing, because they are gymnosperms, and they are dioecious. Um, so there's actually, um, let me see if I can get this right. These are the male cones, and then here are the female cones. They are again pollinated by insects. Um, some produce nectar. They're sporophyte dominant, found in the tropics. Uh, they can be trees, or some of them can be large vines. Okay, now we get to the angiosperms. These are all the flowering plants. And like I said, they can be woody or herbaceous. And angiosperm means seed vessel. And that's because their ovule is always enclosed completely within sporophytic tissue. They are always dioecious. Flowers can either be male or female. Um, and this is the category that contains all the things that you eat, basically. Um, all the herbaceous diets, fruits, vegetables, nuts, herbs, grains, all those things are in this particular category. But in addition to that, it's also economically important because clothing material comes from it, like cotton or linen. Um, building material, uh, hardwood, oak, like hardwood trees, oaks, that kind of thing. And a lot of medicinal things come from this category as well. Okay, so I said we would get to this. So our angiosperms are divided into either monocots or uh, eudicots, also just called dicots. So I will interchangeably use the word eudicot or dicot. It used to be called dicots, and then I guess there were a couple of things thrown in there that weren't truly um, plants with two cotyledons. So eu just means true, so true dicots. So anyway, all right, our monocots have one cotyledon. So if we're looking um, at this diagram, our monocot is right here. And this is going to be like our grains, our grasses, those kind of things. So they have one cotyledon and they have this large endosperm. The eudicots, which is over here on the left, and our example here is a bean, um, have two cotyledons. So one and two. And their endosperm is usually reabsorbed into the seed coat. So it's not huge, and it doesn't always um, it, it doesn't it doesn't remain throughout the maturation. So our cotyledon is the embryonic leaf of the seed, and that develops into the first leaves of the plant, and then the so the difference between that and the endosperm is that nutritive tissue, and that stores nutrients that are required by a developing embryo. Um, within the seed. So if we take a look at each of these, um, I won't go through all the details, but they're both going to have a seed coat. They both either have one or two cotyledons. The radical is what turns into the root. The uh, hypocotyl is what turns into the stem, and the epicotyl is what turns into the leaves. Okay, so I hope that's helpful. Okay, these are key features of monocots versus dicots. And I'll go ahead and tell you, you probably need to know these by heart. Because if I give you a plant, I want you to know whether it's a monocot or a dicot. And you don't always have the seed to look at to go, oh, well, if I dissect the seed, I can tell you. Um, no, I want you to look at the sporophyte generation and go, oh, that's a monocot or a dicot. So how can we tell the difference? Uh, the biggest giveaways are their flowering parts. 
So a monocot has a flower, uh, flower parts like petals, think like that, petals, in threes or multiples of threes. Whereas eudicots, their petals are going to be in either fours or fives or multiples of e either of those. I probably wouldn't worry too much about the pollen grain being one pore versus three pores because oftentimes you're not going to see that pollen grain, but if I were to put it under a microscope, then you could tell me if it was monocot or dicot. Um, the biggest giveaway, if, it's not, if the plant isn't flowering at the time, then take a look at the leaves. In our monocots, those veins run parallel to each other. Whereas in a eudicot, it's the veins form like a net looking thing. And then if we were to do a cross section of the stems, you would notice that the vascular bundles are scattered throughout the stem in a monocot, but are arranged in a specific ring in a eudicot. And then if you dug it out of the ground, the monocots have a fibrous root system. I think I mentioned that when we were talking um, about roots. And then eudicots have a tap root system. Okay, angiosperm flowers. Let's look at So let's take a look at this flower. So there are going to be four major components to it. The stamens, the carpal, the sepals, and the petals. And if a flower has all four of those, it's considered a complete flower. If it's missing either one or more of those parts, then we call it an incomplete flower. So let's take a look at these. So the first one is the stamen, and that's this whole portion right here. And the stamen contains the filament as well as the anther. And the anther is where the pollen grains are produced. And so that tends to be why they're so yellow. So that's the male portion. So then we look at the carpal, and that's this entire thing right here. It tends to be the largest portion in the center of the flower. And um, at the very top is what's called the stigma, and the stigma is very sticky. And the reason it's sticky is so that when pollen grains float through the air, they will land on the stigma. And then the style is just basically this 2B portion right here. And so when the pollen lands on the stigma, it then begins to grow a pollen tube that allows the sperm to come down this style. Okay, then it meets the ovary. That's this whole section right here. And the ovary is what becomes the fruit. So if you have the flower of an apple tree, the ovary becomes the fruit that we eat. And within it is the ovule, which is, of course, where the sperm is going to come. Um, and that ovule becomes the seed. So that's the carpal portion. Okay, then there are um, the sepals. And the sepal are, um, they look leaf-like, but they actually aren't leaves. Um, they're this green portion here, or they're typically green anyway. Um, I'll just note that... Um, Sometimes they are very colorful um, and not green, but typically speaking, they're green. Okay, so the purpose of the sepals is to protect the flower bud before it opens. So each one of these individuals is called a sepal. Altogether, they're called the calyx. Okay, and then we come to the portion that we all really like. Um, our favorite part is the corolla. And the corolla are all the petals put together. Um, and this is what attracts pollinators and, of course, us humans. Um, so if you look at this uh, flower, we notice that this particular one has one, two, three, four, five petals. So what would that tell you about it being monocot or dicot? If it has five petals, we know that it is dicot. Okay, we've been talking about life cycles over and over again, so now I'm going to throw, throw you a curveball because this is unique to flowering plants. Flowering plants undergo what we call double fertilization. That means that one fertilization 
forms the diploid zygote from an egg and a sperm. That's what you're used to. But there's a secondary fertilization that forms from the triploid, uh, sorry, that forms the triploid endosperm, and that's produced from a sperm uniting with what we call a polar nuclei. Okay, so we're gonna go through this nice and slowly, and probably multiple times, just so you know, <laughs> just to make things a little better. Okay, again, I'm starting with our zygote. And it's inside, um, inside the seed, there's an embryo, and it matures into a plant that has stems, roots, and leaves, all vascular tissue. And then we have um, our dioecious plants. So we have a female plant that contains the ovule, and we have the male plant that has the stamen that contains the anther. And so let's start with our uh, female plant with the ovule. So we have a megaspore that has the ovule inside. And uh, let me see if I can see what, show this to you really well. Um, <laughs> so this is our megaspore. And then our microspore is our pollen grain. And the pollen grain, um, if you'll remember, uh, starts to produce that pollen tube. Well, the pollen tube has a tube nucleus, right? And then it also contains two sperm. And that's important. So, trying to make sure I get all this right and say it correctly. Um, so we have polar nuclei, which are <laughs> right here. So it has basically two nuclei. And then here is the egg cell. Those are the important parts of this ovule for you. So with our sperm uh, coming down the tube, we have two sperm, each with a nuclei. One of them is going to come join with this egg and it's going to make a diploid zygote. The second sperm is going to come fertilize these polar nuclei that remember already had two nuclei in it. So that makes three nuclei total. So this is the endosperm is a triploid tissue. Okay, so that means that our zygote right here is diploid, and within the seed, that endosperm is triploid. So I'm just going to go ahead and say you should probably stop and rewind that, go over it again. I will expect you to understand double fertilization, and we'll review it again as well. So you should have everything you need for the chart now, and... Um, We'll see you next time. We'll review double fertilization one more time when we start our next lecture.